Okay. All right. You're listening to I'll Take You There, R&B from NPR Music. I'm your host and curator, Jason King, and I'm here today with the great George Clinton. Roof. Roof. <laughs> we are at uh, Storia Queens at the Museum of the Moving Image, and this is an evening with George Clinton presenting his film Cosmic Slop. It's the 20th anniversary of that incredible piece of work. And it's also a celebration of his new book, Brothers Be Like Yo George, Ain't That Funkin' Kinda Hard On You. I don't know if I said that with the no, proper did. flair and no, soul. You didn't say it right. Okay, either. you've got to say it for me. Brothers Be Yo Like George, Ain't That Funkin' Kinda Hard On You. Okay. You have to sing it as go, Brothers Be Yo Like George, Ain't That Funkin' Kinda Hard On You. Okay, I will be working on that for a while, I think. And tonight, we're also going to see a conversation between George Clinton and James Ntume, the legendary record producer and songwriter and so on, hosted by Warrington Hudlin. So that's what we're celebrating tonight. So I've got a few questions for you uh, to begin with, Mr. Clinton. I wanted to talk to you about rhythm and blues itself, which is the focus of this stream that we have on NPR, NPR and B. Mm -hmm. um, rhythm and blues has been defined so many different ways by different people. One of my favorite definitions is by Amiri Baraka, where he calls rhythm and blues one persona of black music. And I think that's an interesting way of putting it, that it's a persona of black music. Yeah, one of the, one of the eras we came through and one of the titles we gave it politically, economically, whatever, for whatever reason, it changes every now and then. From race music, to rhythm and blues, to R&B, to disco, to funk, blues, jazz, all of it has been, one time or another, the same thing, rhythm and blues, pop music even. Motown was considered pop music, but it was also rhythm and blues when it comes time to go get that record played. They still wanted them to break it on a rhythm and blues station and then cross it over. You know, so rhythm and blues, R&B, urban, you know, whatever. They, I mean, it's all the same. Music. It's all So for you, all of those terms are describing the Black same thing? Black dance music. Black love music, you know, black music, just in this basic form. R&B, it gets sold. I mean, to me, it's still the essence of what we did is do up. What Motown did is music for young America, they called it. But it was still R&B, it was still rhythm and blues when you come to pop stations and R&B stations. Now, we can break it on down and say soul Oh, um, easy listening it's still that same you know vibe I call it funk too it's the same thing yeah because I think the issue is there was there was funk before there was funk right music was funky before well that's funk, the basic yeah. that's the basic element of it and then it just started being cut up into other things as you put a, a cut on it you know funk and gospel both of those are like the the earthiest, you know, it's going to get. It can be funky or it could be gospel. I think they both start off at the same real elementary root when you, there was no instrument from people just hit on things and, and hum. It could either be a gospel song or it could be a funk celebration. I think that's the same period. Then it started getting, to me, it started getting into the, the blues and the, you know, the rhythmic parts of it and becomes um the most sophisticated they get is still the R and B. Okay, which and that's urban, a quiet storm, or just love songs, R and B love songs. So how would you define soul? I would say the same thing, but it was calmed out and almost named like rock and roll was named as white music. Soul started becoming what Stax did. Arthur Connolly, Sam and Dave, so sweet soul music. It became a really R&B music that became really pop music. It be, just like Motown, it was like the funkiest, for, for a while the funkiest R&B music you could get was from Stax. But it flipped somewhere right along, you know, Arthur Connolly and Sam and Dave. All of it flipped, 
flipped over into what they call soul music. Now, we had another definition for soul, and that was, would have been, well, I guess it's still the same thing, Wilson Pickett and Aretha Franklin. But, you know, it's it changes according to periods of time. Soul music actually became, you know, Otis Redding was still doing soul music, but that's part of that Stax thing that became very popular, say, with white people. So one of the ways that people have defined soul is that people have said the soul is a feeling. Oh, yeah. You often hear that, right? No, it, yeah. It's yeah. based in emotion. Then, it's, then you're going to get your R&B, funk, and all that. It's all going to start coming to be the same definition for all of it. When you start putting in that emotion and feeling and slavery overtones or gospel, it becomes still that same urge. And I think it was the Ishmael Reed called it Just Grew. You know, that vibe in us. Today, young kids call it swag. You know, today that's the term. But it's that same element that makes us want to rap, you want to put rhythm to everything. We put rhythms to arguments. You know what I mean? You know, you see the body language. It's that swag that we put into music, no matter what we call it. Then you break it down into demographics according to money being made, you know, according to philosophies, according to age brackets. I mean, that's certainly one way to describe what soul is, right? The ability to pull out a kind of experience out of the body. And call to, it whatever you want to call it, but that soul, that's, that's that gospel, that's that blues, that's the funk, you know, it's all of them indicate that same urgency. One of the things I think you've done so brilliantly in music is you've pioneered and innovated certain kinds of grooves, right? That are so, they're deep grooves to me. When I hear a P funk groove, it's as deep as, deep rhythmically and energetically as anything I've heard in popular music. I don't hear a lot of deep groove in contemporary pop, popular music anymore. It seems like it's almost been marginalized. It has, the style for the day for kids is marginalized. That's where they're taking it. And they're taking it either in a loop form, which is real short, but they'll stretch that out into long lengths of time and just call it electronic dance music. It's still, they arrive at the same place, but for now, that's what they want. That's what the kids want. And you're going to always have to go where the kids go. Ain't no getting around that. You just have to find a different route to get there. But you got to pay attention because they set the tempo for the time of where they're going to be shaking their butt at. You might want to do another style, but you better have that same kind of tempo because that's, that's bio clock. But another way I could put it is I think some of your best songs – have a deep groove that's transcendent. So when oh, yeah. I hear it, I want to move, I want to... With know. us, we break the rules all the time. We don't even consider ourselves part of it. We're going to do a 10-minute song even though the tension span is 10 seconds. We're going to still do 10-minute songs and let them chop it up into samples if they want to. But we're still going to put Knee Deep out for 15 minutes. I got a new album out, got 33 songs on there. And a lot of them are seven and eight minutes. So it ain't about... You know, turn down for what? I ain't trying to slow down either. You know, but we still follow the, the tempo of the time. We still know the bio clock of what they dance into, you know, on YouTube. That's what I look at more than anywhere. Gotcha. And one of the other things I think is, is so powerful about your body of work is, well, it takes me to something that the writer Entezaki Shange once said, which is that it's really hard to make people think and dance at the same time. So the, the kind of the politics, the engagement with what's going on in society, social issues, social criticism, and groove and funk, that's a very unusual mixture. We did a record, like, again, called Knee Deep. And the theory behind that song was rescue dance music from the blahs. You know, it was, people still want to dance, and I mean, I have nothing against, like, hip hop. I'm, each individual, I mean, not hip hop, but disco. I love hip hop, but disco. You know, I didn't like the fact that it was all being the same beat. You know, so we would when I went out of our way to make a 15-minute song and not let it get boring, a deep groove like you say, but color, you know, knee deep goes all over the place. 
but that was our intention to rescue dance music from the blahs. You know, because everybody was coming down on on disco so hard. You know, and we, I knew it was in trouble because you could fax those beats in. You know what I'm saying? It was the same one over and over. Each individual record was good, but when you put them all together with the same beat, you know, it, you know, it's kind of irritating. But don't you hear some of that kind of monotony in music? Still but today? they they found a different way to approach it. Yeah. They got computers now that can tune out those irritating frequencies, and and they learn to dance to it. And that's the groove of the day. Electronic music is, you know, your your butt will betray you if you try not to dance, because they're gonna find a groove. They're gonna find a beat, just like uh, Pharrell do every time he come out. He know where that frequency is. And then you take him now, Roger, you put the 808 on that, and you you can electronic dance music all day long. And all the other electronic groups that's out there, they know they found the frequency. And everybody will dance to it one way or the other. They may put their raps over top of it, or they sample a little bit, but we all gonna conform because that's the big, the big picture right now. When you say the word frequency, can you talk about what you mean by that in music? Because I think some people, it's, it's very I mean, you know, it's, it's, the, it's not very, it was abstract for me when I was growing up. It was really abstract. But with today, with computers and, and um, cell phones, all of that's frequency. All of that's how we communicate nowadays. It's a frequency for everything. Vibration. You know, a vibration that's literal. Used to be metaphysical when you talk about frequencies. Not no more. That's every day. They be texting and faxing and and all of the ways they communicate. Those are frequencies that people communicate all day long. And it's not weird no more. It's, it's almost obsolete, you know, from the fast as we're traveling. Is the way that you're making music now different from the way that you used to make music. Obviously, analog to digital was a big change. Yes. But there's so many tools and software and so on at your disposal. But I still do it both ways. I'll cut it analog first, switch it over to digital, and back to mix it. I have to use both of them because both of them is valid to me. You know what I'm saying? But I do recognize that the digital software can emulate certain things, but certain things they can't feel it. They can just make the sound like it, but you really need a Marsha amp and a, and a, and a, and a um, Telecaster, a Fender, or Stratocaster. Fender to sound like Jimi Hendrix. You can get a frequency tone to sound like him, but the real deal is a cheap Fender guitar and a Marsha amp. Turn it up loud and walk anywhere near it. You're going to sound like it. Be some frequency there. There gonna be some frequency. I mean, Jimi Hendrix made frequency sound like religion. He made it sound like um, sexual healing. He took noise, made that frequency enjoyable. That's a good example of what you can do with frequency. Feedback would be a noise ordinarily, unless he know how to control it and make it a frequency that's pleasurable. What skills do you think you learned? from being around so many of the people that we today would call the greats, um, whether it's a sly, whatever, you know, listening to their sounds and so on and being around these people, what skills do you think you have today that are kind of missing in, in popular music? Missing in? Or if any, or maybe there is. I mean, they just, to me, they just always change styles. You find versions of it and whatever new thing is happening it may not be what I did what Sly did. Or, but you're a skilled musician. Yeah. I mean, and you're a I musician first I, and foremost. No, right? I don't look at it. You don't like, see it that way? No, I mean, I, I, know, I know for a fact that the minute the kids started making it simplistic and non-musical, that that's the new shit. That's it. So, I mean, I ain't going to go But they all want to get your stuff, too. They yeah, want to sample you. I, but they have to go through that, and them coming through it, they're going to find a new way of doing it, sound different, until they get to where... They figure they master to the point it can be perfected. They're going to do whatever kids do, and that's going to always be very minute. Like when I was growing up at Bop, Bop, and Doom, I'm the Bop, Bam, Boom. Musicians and parents said, well, y'all shut up. That's not music. As we got later on, whoa, hi, hey, and funking and chanting and grooving along, 
musicians say, well, that's a groove, but that's not, you know. But as we perfected that and became really sophisticated in our productions, somebody comes along with poof, 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 and take it all the way back, start it over again. And that's the mission of kids. Whenever you think you done got it so slick and that you can't do no more, they're going to take it back to elementary and start over. And the bitch don't kill my vibe. Bitch don't kill my vibe. And, that's, and he is bad dude of this time. You know, Kendrick Lamar is that one you're talking about. Yeah. Of the new generation. He do it different, but it's still in the scheme of things. He's the, he's it. A few years ago, it was Rakim for as I was concerned. You know, cause, or Eminem. What is it you hear in there? Lyrics that are unbelievable. I mean, conversations and, and rock him with the flow of what they pride themselves on doing. You couldn't even tell when he took a breath. And not only his words that he's saying, but his technical way of doing it, delivery. He didn't dance. He had, he was everything that flow meant. He got flow. He was all that, and then was saying something. Eminem did the same thing on another tempo, but he's unending with his jokes and his puns and his, you know I mean? I wouldn't play the dozens with him for, you know, you know I would lose immediately because the art of playing the dozens is the first one to get mad, lose. You start out losing with him. You know, and that's just the way it is. Certain people have certain styles and for that time. For that time, they be the thing. But it also sounds like what you're describing with these particular artists you're, you're mentioning, Eminem or Rakim or Kendrick Lamar, they also have craft, right? They have, yes. it's not just flow or an ability to no, access rhythm. but they worked but it. They worked it. That's they the worked key, yeah. at it. You know, you, I mean, like, you can add a little bit of freestyle and whatever, you, but no, they did all of that and to the point that they are the representatives of their time for what you was talking about. Who do I see in... Different eras, there's different people that comes out doing it to that extent in whatever direction you is going in. Whether I agree with his value or whatever musically, I don't enter the picture because kids gonna do what you don't even want to hear. They don't, they love it when you don't like it. Gotcha. Why do you think you you and your music have had such longevity and means so much to so many people? Just just what I said. I learned to get in step with whoever's coming up next, <laughs> and I try not to lose that. You know, even though I may want to say, Danny, music, I know better than that. I know that every bit of that that makes me want to say that is what gives that energy to become that music. So I just don't fight it and say, let me pay attention, figure out what they're doing, and get in before they recognize I'm still around here for my whole ass. <laughs> But has that always been the case with you? I mean, even like Funkadelic, right? That's Thinking of the change from Parliament to Funkadelic. Especially during that time. Yeah. I did never want to be in a position where I got to come up with a hit single. That's like the most... Um, that's why you got one hit wonders. Because people change every two or three years. Just like kids don't want to hit their older brother and sister artists. So you, you need to be out of here in three years anyway. So once we did testify our first hit record and saw that it was changing even from Motown, who I thought was unending. <laughs> and then here comes somebody coming singing what my mother used to listen to. And this becoming a hit, well, what I heard in school, Shake It Up, Baby. I heard that in school myself. Here's somebody else come back singing that and becoming the Beatles and Rolling Stones. I realized I better get me a thing of my own. Branding, that's early branding. Branding, mm -hmm. and don't change it. I don't care if they want to change it. Funk to something else. No, I'm not going for that R and B or urban or any. No, I'm psychedelic. I'm funkadelic, and I have to keep saying that even when we were totally out of step with everything going on. And that became a point. And when hip hop came along, sampling it, we had just enough straw to hold on to, because that was the funk in that music, and I could relate to that. They could relate to us, so we were able to stay around if we knew what to do. And what included was, don't go out there screaming, that's my music, but hey, you want some more? You want some, that's only a sample. I could flashlight up and give you the bass line. You know, I, can, I know how to get in. One of the things I took from your book is that you're not only 
you know, incredibly creative and brilliantly creative, but also shrewd. And you know, I mean, it's a business at the end of the day, right? I mean, I didn't do that at first. <laughs> not if, but but the understanding that, you know, mm-hmm. the music is going mainstream, and that there's, you know, just even just what you're saying right now that you know, you're staying ahead of the curve or even pushing the curve or pushing the envelope. There's a certain kind of recognition also that it is a business at the end of the day right. too, right? Well, I'm I mean, finding that out you know, lately as I done cleaned my act up, got sober, got off crack and started taking care and fighting for my copyright, for my heirs. You know, I've learned that, and I knew it all along, but it, nothing motivated me to run a change like this fight for the copyrights from the lawyers and the record companies that's literally combined in a conspiracy to get something that fueled all of the hip hop generation, all of my generation. That music is going to the Smithsonian, that spaceship. That is not just some song that I just wrote a contract and signed. I didn't sign the contract, first of all. But the, the whole story, without me sitting here talking about that, I'd rather for people to actually look at page 379 on. That's the story and the reason why I wrote the book. Yeah. And it is a story that needs to be told by somebody not, you know, mad, crying, or on crack, or anything. You have to be clear to tell because it's unbelievable. You're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. They're trying to take from my kids, my heirs, and the rest of the band member ears. So that's what that whole book is about. So I think we probably got to wrap up in a second, but I just want to ask you a question about the contemporary record business. Some people would say there's not much of a record business <laughs> these days <laughs> because recordings don't sell the way they used to because of you know illegal but downloading there's, and there's the still quality of music. IP is still intellectual properties yes. involved. In, you can make records and make a way to sell records. Like this book I've got. You got five songs on that book. But the app on that book, you take your phone and, and bleep the, the book. There's ways to get songs out there. And the book itself, the title, Brother Be Yo Like George, is the title of the first single of the album. You're shrewd. You have, <laughs> to, figure a, out, you have good... to figure a way to stay around here. They ain't, they ain't making it easy. <laughs> That's what I mean. Um, and yet, you know, all, the other thing about it is it's maybe not even these days about selling recordings, right. but touring and so on. And and you guys you, were pioneers. And then your you music know. be soundtrack for movies and commercials. There's lots of ways to, to work IP. You know, it's not just record that you might have to, just, like I said, give them the way. That record come free with the book. You know, but that's 33 more. That, <laughs> if you like them, you're going to get. Funk is dope. You know, they say that music is dope. You can't just have one deeper than potato chips. <laughs> are, have you, do you feel like you've achieved everything you wanted to achieve career-wise? I don't, or you have, ever, are you still, I don't ever want to feel like that. Yeah. Then you get lazy and don't have nothing to aspire for. Ab- like, Abby Lincoln used to say you can't retire from the arts. No, you can't. It's just, there's no, no it ain't, you ain't got nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. just want to thank you. Thank you, man. For this and... Just for everything, for your music, for your spirit, for who you are, and all. Let's of those go things. watch this scary movie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, man. So I've just finished an interview with the legendary George Clinton, and here we are at the Museum of the Moving Image in Astoria, Queens, and we're about to head to the main theater to hear George Clinton being interviewed by Imtume. For those who don't know, Imtume is a legendary musician, band leader, songwriter, producer. He had his own group called him Tume, and one of his most famous songs was Juicy Fruit, which was, of course, sampled uh, throughout the course of hip hop, uh, one of the most sampled songs in the history of hip hop. Um, but he also produced seminal artists like Stephanie Mills in the 1970s and, and wrote The Closer I Get to You with his writing partner, Reggie Lucas. So Mtume is himself a legendary R&B figure. Um, he's somebody whose name sort of stands for so much in music, and he's iconic. So what we're going to see tonight is two icons, George Clinton and Tume, speaking to each other about their shared history in R&B music. So let's take a walk over to that theater and, and listen to them. And please welcome to the stage, George Clinton!
Yeah. 20 years, brother, 20 <laughs> years. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> well, well, first of all, I, I just want to say, when you get a chance to in, in, interview and have a chance to talk and have a discussion with a man of George's stature and contribution to the music, it's extra special when that person happens to be a friend. I remember the first time before we get into it, I'll tell you the first time I saw you, brother. I was with Miles Davis. We were playing Paul's Mall. See, you really, in Boston. I was just there la night for last. Okay. <laughs> I mean, up and down Boyle to Boyle right, Street. Right, Street. So the hotel, remember, used to be across the street. So we, we're driving up because we came in the, the night before, and we're checking in, and, but we looked over and said, tonight, one night only, Parliament Funkadelic. And I'd heard the rumors, <laughs> but I had this, you know, me, Miles, Reggie Lucas, Pete Cozy, Michael Henderson. Michael Henderson. Yeah, we shot, we checked in and shot right across there. And like I said, I heard the rumors, but you came out, I think, in a coffin you had on a uh, a Roman short, you know, two two two, two. <laughs> and, and a diaper and a diaper, right? Yeah, yeah. Gary, Gary had the diaper, and I think what was happening. I think y'all were rolling with uh, standing on the verge, and I'll never forget when it came to the hook. We said, "People, what you doing?" And you lift up that tutu. And it was just a ding ding there. You said standing on the verge. I mean, the whole joint fell out, man. You know? if they, if they told me I did shit like that. <laughs> See, I don't, I don't recall that. I don't, I don't recall that. But look, before we, before we get started, like I said, we just. It's if, such it, a like I said, if it wasn't for flashbacks, I wouldn't have no memory at all. <laughs> let's, let's, let's dig this. What is soul? I don't know. Soul is the ham hocks in your cornflakes. Ain't it nasty? What is soul? I don't know. It's the ring around your bathtub. Free your mind and your ass will follow. You remember this one? I have tasted the maggots in the mind of the universe and I was not offended. Oh, I knew I had to rise above it all or drown in my own shit. Woo! That's a flash forward. <laughs> so, so George, let, let's, let's start here. And I know, man, you've been doing a, a lot of interviews. You know, the book is out. You know, we've talked, you know, many, many, many times about different uh, uh, subjects musically. But I want to try to cover some things that people may not have asked. Because it's more than just the music. George Clinton set up a new business model in black music. And that business model was taking a group and making it an umbrella from which several groups and other artists were created and placing them at different companies at the same time. At the height of that, how many, how many artists were you producing? Well, probably about, about 35 at, 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 at once with all the groups. Because all the groups, you know, Bootsy, um, the Horny Horns, Fred Maysell, them, Bernie. Parliament, Funkadelic, Bernie War Warrell's group, Eddie Hazel's group, Parlette, Brides right. of Funkenstein. It was quite a few of us. You know, then outside of that, you know, we worked with a lot of other groups. Um, Trey Lou, you know, Felipe Wynn, you know. We had a quite an army going for a minute. I want to ask you for, for those young people, I, and I think Wu Tang would be a good example who used that model they you know, did years it, later with hip hop. They did it very well. I was going to say that if you didn't cover it. Well, you know, we, we eating at the same lunch counter, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Wu Tang made very good use of the concept. George, could you explain to us when you were sitting down and this concept was unfolding? Nobody else had done that, and I want everybody to be clear, nobody had ever done that. What pushed you in that direction, and, and, and what was the impetus well, for you to make was that? Well, there wasn't no group, per se, an artist had done it, but a few record companies had done it, starting with uh, Phil Spector, 
he had the Rondettes, the Crystals, and his whole entourage. And even Motown with the Motown Review. They had all of their acts traveling together. So it was easy for us having Parliament, then out band Funkadelic. Out of necessity, we ended up with two different groups, not just one group. Parliament couldn't do it because of labor commitments. So we used our little brothers. We became their backup singers. You know, put them out front. And so that's 10 of us. When Bootsy came to play with us, we, we realized he was an a artist within himself. He was no Funkadelic. So we t I told him, you work with me on certain type of sound for Parliament, I'll help you with funk, I mean, help you with whatever you want to name your group. We came up Bootsy Rubber Band. So that, right away, that's another 10 people. You know, so, and it kept on like, they kept growing out of necessity. The background singers in the studio became Parlette, and, and the rest of them became the brides. So it just kept growing. Every time we turned around, the roadies want to sing. <laughs> we, we recorded them. You know, everybody wanted to be on stage, so the best way to, to keep it all going and give everybody their dream. And after a while, the mothership was flying around for almost seven years just on the ship. Yeah. You know, all the way up until Atomic Dog. Now, one thing you, you brought up, Bootsy, and, and, and one thing you, you and I and, and any musician knows who puts a band together or a group, a general is only as great as the soldiers, okay? And you had some soldiers that were some of the most original you know, musicians on this planet. And uh, let's, start with, let's start with Bernie Worrell. How did, how did, you I said, we're going to go through some stuff that people yeah. ain't going to ask you. I want, I want, we're going to talk about the soldiers you selected. Oh, yes. Bernie Worrell, that was starting at the height of any place you want to go. We started out with, you know, Bernie, before he went to Boston to go to school. When he came home from school, we had a hit record, I Just Want to Testify. So he was able to take the kids, Eddie, Hazel, Billy Bass, Teak, and Tao, who was just getting started with their instruments. We were able to, while they learned their instruments, Bernie was able to incorporate his classical training right in the midst of all the rock and roll and psychedelic stuff we were playing. We were able to do what King Crimson, Emerson Lake and Palmer, only a few groups, even in the European section, were doing that. So with Bernie, we were able to train the other musicians to be what Eddie Hazel became. Maggot Brain, Billy Bass, you know, the whole Funkadelic, what they all became, Bernie was the spearhead of that. You know, and from Bernie, all the rest of them developed their talent to become, you know, what Eddie became. And then on top of that, like you said, Bootsy. With Bootsy, he brings his brother, Catfish, you know, and not only that, he brought Fred Wesley and Maceo Parker. With that, with that team right there, you can start a war. Because <laughs> yeah, we had the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back a little bit. Like you made reference to I Just Want to Testify, which was a huge, huge hit in the black community. I think you had some pop success with that too. Oh yeah, that was it yeah, was a big record. It really was a big record. It was a pop record, mm -hmm. you know, one of those that got on CKLW and crossed over. You know, it was a big record, but it's hard to keep getting singles. You know, and after testify, it was hard to get another hit. We had one called I Bet You, which was very big. I mean the Jackson Five covered it after we did it. You know, but like I said, it was just so hard getting singers that I said, forget trying to get a singer. I started going after albums, the way the jazz artists did it, or the way rock and roll was doing it. You know, like Jimmy and all Cream and all those, they sold albums. So we did first uh, Mama What's a Funkadelic, then Free Your Mind, Your Ass Will Follow. And we tried to go so far away from what was normal 
that people wouldn't ever want to put us in a bag again. We made a playground for ourselves that to this day, if we do something, they say, well, that's Funkadelic, they can do it. You know, and so that gave us room to try atomic dogs, or, you know, a flashlight, stuff that had never been done before. We'd do it just because we would try and sell albums and not singles. So we did we took all kind of chances. When you were making this transition from a, a, basically a singing group, you know, would testify. We all know there's a process in transition. What were some of the other influences that was coming in? We just dropped the acid. <laughs> well, that's the process. Process. I mean, I ain't, ain't going to lie. That was, all, that was overnight. That was, we went to Boston. I was just, just there. That's why I said about if it wasn't flashbacks, I wouldn't have no memory. Because I just saw all of my past the last couple of days while I was being over at Harvard. Um, yes, we had a hit record. We went out on one tour all around the country. We got to Boston. The same people y'all met when y'all got there. <laughs> they turned us out. And we were, I mean, I think I was probably the last standing hippie, you know, up until four years ago. <laughs> I but you still hip. <laughs> oh, no, it's cool. I mean, I don't regret nothing. But we definitely took off, you know, from Boston back in 67. And it was overnight. I mean, from Parliament to doo-wop group, we realized it wasn't going to happen. So we just we went in and made did Free Your Mind in about two days. We just went in there. We tripped right through the two days. Recorded it, mixed it, and by the end of the week we was putting it out. I think the pictures took longer than they're cutting the record. <laughs> <laughs> Finding the girl to do the cover. <laughs> Whatever was on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> you know, since since Warrington is here, I don't you know War Warrington likes to know I inside inside stuff. Oh Warrington, Reggie, they knew everything right. about us. I mean, um, I think your mother told me, she said, I didn't know what was wrong with my kids. They, they have posters around their room with a guy with a skirt on, you know, and wigs. So I didn't know what was wrong with him. You know, they've been funky all their life, even in college. <laughs> Intellectual college. <laughs> You know, one, one, again, we're going to talk about some of the influences that you were absorbing also. And, and, uh, and also leave time for Q&A. No, man. Anyway. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I tried. Uh, I tried. You asked me to come over here, right? Okay. No, I'm just teasing. Okay. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. I'm playing. <laughs> Would you tell or, or, or speak to the influence that was on all of us that is not referenced often enough, I think, in, the, in all of the music, jazz and everything else? Sun Ra. All right. Come on. Let's talk about Sun Ra. Come on. Wow. <laughs> you know, I'm getting that question so much lately. And I didn't even find out about his music till a couple of years before he passed. And I knew the name. And I had started to see the image that, you know, what people said we were, we were about in look and in concept. But I think I probably was out there for real. And I didn't, in a, you know, it's a big galaxy. And I'm into the dog star, you know, serious. And I forgot where he was from Saturn. <laughs> I, think that, I think that's where he was coming from. But <laughs> we didn't happen to bump into each other, <laughs> you know, but I knew the name. And um, like I said, even Larry Young. Remember Larry? Oh, come, come on, yes. I mean, we grew a great, up. Great jazz organist. He, we grew up together, and he used to tell me about Sun Ra. But I, I, I don't know what I thought he was talking about, because he was out there himself. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great organist, you know, one of the great. But I didn't realize until I ran into Sun Ra's band just prior to him passing. And we were getting ready to try to get together and do tours. And I played with almost all the musicians. You know, one place or another, but we never got a chance to, to meet. I mean, I met him, you know, he used to play right, right in Detroit, right behind 
uh, United Sound at the college campus, Wayne, Wayne State. He was playing there, so I've seen, and, I, and, and he was actually playing um, the Temptation song, My Girl, from behind the piano. <laughs> do, 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 do. And that, that hurt my mind. <laughs> Just trying to figure out how you can, he was out there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I can understand the, the relation, like I say, of the look, but I never got a chance. You know what? That, that is, for me, this is, this is deep because it's so much the cosmology. I, you understand? I, like you said, you spoke Miles. I told Miles the same thing. You lied. You damn lied. <laughs> you had to. And I, I, mean, I didn't get a chance. George. I, I mean, Wait. since then, I, excuse me. I got all his doo-wop records. Sunrise, when he was in Chicago doing right. doo-wop, I had no idea about any of that. I had to go back and do a, a, another history lesson, just like I said about Robert Johnson. All right. I had to go back and learn about something that I should have known about. For those of you who may have not ever heard Sunrise, you can go to YouTube, put up some of his music. And uh, you'll see what George and I are saying. And even even though you know you never sat down with him, there's a very intimate. Oh, oh I can see that yeah, now yeah. myself. Yeah. And let's move to another uh, great musician, Eddie Hazel. You mentioned him. <laughs> and, uh, unsung, one of the greatest guitarists that ever blessed us. Eddie was unbelievable because he learned all of that. I mean, he could play blues as a kid, but when he got into Funkadelic and got his new guitar, he learned Jimi Hendrix, Cream, within six months. I bought all those albums for him at one time. In 67, he sat down and learned, while Billy them couldn't even play a bass, he could strum it, but that was it. They learned all of that by the time Testify was, uh, you know, off the chart and we needed a second record out, they were playing it. And by the time we did good old funky music, which was a year and a half, we had the best band around Detroit and Eddie was spearheading it along, you know, with Bernie always there to help me put what they needed behind them. Eddie, unorthodox as he was, was the great singer. I mean, he sing as good as he could play guitar, but he make his own self cry. <laughs> he, he was so passionate. If you listen to that, some of the, like, you know, some of the songs he did, Let Me Be, he, I mean, just like Glenn Goins. Mm -hmm. yeah. Them two, them two and Gary Scheider. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All of them, went to, you know, they all grew up together. Can you imagine them at 15, all three of them? Because they all were like that. At that young age around the barbershop, I basically knew Billy, then, no, Billy and Bernie, I knew them. But the other two, Glenn and Eddie came after we got a hit record. Let's, let's talk about the barbershop. Oh yeah, the barbershop was loaded with them. And they, we kept kids around, to, you know, that's how I get my inspiration from kids. We bought them amps and we let them play and you get a feel for what's coming next. And that's the way they were. The barbershop was loaded with a bunch of kids till we finally got the community center to give us a place to rehearse. And we had Funkadelic as one set with Eddie, Billy, Tal, and Tiki and Bernie. We had Gary Boogie in the group called US as the second string Funkadelic. And it went on like that. The barbershop was just a place where we turned out good musicians and singers. George, when you conceived of the whole concept of the funk mob and funkadelic and parliament, what there was something obviously you felt wasn't happening. There was there was some space that wasn't filled in the music, and you you felt that need. To, to bring something that had never been heard well, before. We gravitate to that. We couldn't plan that. There's no way to plan it. It's just what happens as you're trying to survive and stay there, the things you have to do, you know, like when the band members leave and go play with the Temptations, 
we had to end up getting another band, which was Gary and Boogie. So sounds change with, as you change the musicians. And I had to change philosophy just seeing that Motown was on his way to L.A. The European invasion was coming. We had to change if we wanted to stay there. Chamber Brothers was the only model for a black group playing rock and roll. Time, the famous record, Time. Yeah. yeah. We stole their drummer. <laughs> 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 Jerome Bigfoot Bradley. And yeah, he played with Chamber of Jazz. And um, when we did Tear the Roof Off, Bootsy and him, and we had a whole new sound. We always got sounds according to what was n needed. So it wasn't something like I just sat down and said, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Is that this is what we're working with. This is what we're going to use. So I have to figure out what can we do best with what we got. And that itself is a funky concept. I mean, do the best you can and funk it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I've always admired about you, uh, and you know, having played with Miles for five years, there's a certain thing that you see in a visionary and that is that visionary's ability to embrace whatever's coming and take that, take that thing that's coming and shape it in their own image. You've never been closed to hip hop. And you know, a lot of the brothers that came along and sisters when we came along, they heard this new music and uh, you know, there's some political overtones to, to why that, because it also was a divide in the young and the old in the community, because we, we can't leave that out. But you, and, men, and, and many of us, but, but you in particular, because you were the one that was out front. How do you feel about that music and what, what you and others have laid down as being the DNA in terms of what sampling was, was really the transfer of the DNA? Proud as hell. You know what I'm saying? For real. I mean, think about it. The only way you would hear your music before it was on some k tail package on TV. <laughs> that would be the only time you get to hear your song again. When hip hop came along and I hear them using for segues purposes mainly, get the intro, block them, block them from needy, and so it be myself. And I, it was weird, but well, I'm in the game. And if I'm in the game, I know how to get mine. <laughs> you know, so like I said, I rushed and made an album called Sample Summer Disc and Sample Summer Dad. <laughs> you know, so I, if I get an opportunity, I'm glad that they did it, sampled it. I'm glad they found a way to keep us, because usually kids don't want to hear their brothers and sisters' music or their mother and father music. So we were lucky enough when I heard them participating because we wasn't finished anyway. But you have to get out of there every four years, three or four years, playing obsolescence, plus kids grow up, they don't want to hear what they big brothers. So that's normal. We found a way to circumvent that because we were being involved by the way of sampling. I was so glad of that. I made sure that Snoop, Dre, Cube, Humpty, Africa Bimbada, I knew where everybody was located, and I made ourselves, uh, you know, available to that. Now a lot of people around was saying that ain't music, but I know whenever you hear that, that is the music. When you tempted to say that ain't music, that means your ass is getting old, <laughs> and, you, and you need to get out of there, or shut up and listen to what's coming. Because if you do that, you can quietly stay around. They won't notice your whole ass. <laughs> <laughs> if when they do, you you you'll be have found your way in and become part of it. And I trying to show them nothing. I ain't trying. I'm learning what they doing with my stuff. So I end up sampling my own records, <laughs> same way they were doing. If you got, if you want to be around, you want to avoid that thing that makes you feel like you're being com competitive to the younger ones. Because you ain't no competition. It ain't your crowd no more. Unless you know how to dance. You can do like Aqua Boogie. Dance under the water and not get wet. <laughs> you can find a rhythm that lets you stay there. But you can't assume that you know shit. <laughs> Yo, what you know is already. 
in your DNA or in, you know what I'm saying, in the past. It will come around again if you're patient enough to stay around. Cause lucky it, enough. Uh, lucky <laughs> enough to stay around. It come around again, and when some come new, oh, I know something about that. They might be covering it up with the costume, or act, but it's still that same 4-4 four, four that they did in 67 with Motown. You know, when I hear all the new, I can pretty much put my finger on where the record's coming from. When Rihanna had SOS out, I said, this is it. Whoever this person is, is going to be around. And kids was like, what do you know about the ground? <laughs> She's still around. Beyonce, on the other hand, I tell you, she will always be around. She is that bad. She is that one for this generation. She is it. George, it's been more than a pleasure, brother. It's been an experience again. Thank you all very much. Woo.